Hey everybody, Steve Prusbrowski here, good day. Welcome to episode six of How to Excel at Fire Department Promotional Exams. Episode six is gonna dive more into the Promotional Assessment Center process. Um, and in episode five, we talked about what an assessment center is. Hey, it could be as simple as a written examination and or an oral interview. I mean, that might be it, but typically more and more departments are you know, expecting more of a promoted candidate. I wanna talk about now what will I be graded on during my next promotional examination? Um, just like in episode five, I share the different events you may expect in an assessment center. Let's talk about what you'll be graded on, or specifically, they're called dimensions or behaviors, the bigger picture items that you're gonna, be get, you're gonna get graded on. So, let's get going. All right, my website, code3firetraining.com, is a free stuff link with lots of great free information. It says free stuff, promotional preparation, officer development, leadership stuff, I've helped many across the country and probably outside of the country, help them in the pursuit of being the best they can be, which may or may not include getting promoted because not everyone wants to get promoted. But again, lots of great information on there as well as my contact information to help you be um, better prepared for whatever it is you want to be. All right. These webinars are based on one of the three books I've had published. Um, the other two being entry-level firefighter preparation books, which are available off my website, as is this one right here. But this book specifically was created just to help those preparing for a promotional exam. And I'm also excited to say that I'm working with a big publisher right now to have my fourth book, also on promotional preparation, hopefully out by the end of next year, excuse me, the end of 2020, if not early 2021. And I'll talk obviously more about that when I have more details to share. So. In this episode, we're going to answer a part of the question, because I get asked this all the time. What are they looking for? I mean, first of all, it's like, who the heck are they? But that's what everyone says. What are they? What do they want? What do they want to hear? What are they looking for? Well, usually they is the fire chief, because the fire chief's ultimately the one that promotes you. But the fire chief doesn't usually get involved with the assessment center. Usually it's raiders at lower ranks that are there to evaluate you. So for the purpose of this, they is pretty much the raiders. So as I touched on in the last episode, when you're going for a promotional exam, usually the raters are from the outside for the most part. There may be internal raters. There's nothing wrong with either one, but most departments usually have outside raters. They're usually at one rank above, if not two ranks above. They may be at the same rank, depending on the rank you're going for. Um, like for example, if you're testing for engineer, you'll probably have company officers as your evaluators because they're supervisors, but you could also have a senior engineer um, that is good at their job as an evaluator. I mean, nothing says that can't happen. Um, if you're going for a captain position, you're probably going to have battalion chiefs or higher as raiders. If you're going for a battalion chief position, you'll probably have deputies, divisions, assistant chiefs, or even fire chiefs as your raider. And if you're going for a fire chief position, you'll probably have other fire chiefs because um, that's the highest rank fire chief in the fire service. You'll also probably have a city manager or other department heads, your coworkers or future coworkers. But anyway, the raiders are that they. So what are they looking at? So typically they, the Raiders, will have a series of questions to ask you, standardized questions to ask you, score pad, some type of documentation sheet to grade you and rate you on. Uh, but typically they're gonna grade you like ABC passing or D or F not passing. You know, 70% and above is passing. So typically like you had in high school, 90 to 100 is A. 80 to 90 is a B, 70 to 80 is a C, and anything below 70 is a D or an F. That's typically how we do it in the fire service. It's pretty standard. I mean, you got to focus on that 70%. And that's what I'm going to try to focus on in this episode and future episodes of, I mean, obviously passing, but just because you pass doesn't mean you get promoted. You got to shoot for the 90s. Rarely does anyone get 100, but you got to shoot for the 90s and high 80s. So what are they grading you on? It's pretty simple. I remember when I was taking the captain's test for the first time about 20 years ago, I remember our deputy chief of training, he came out, we had an orientation session and he's like, all right guys, here's all the dimensions that the Raiders next month, because we had about a month to prepare for the assessment center. This is what they are gonna be evaluating you candidates on. They're all obviously gonna be asking you a series of questions, but this is what they're grading you on. And I'm thinking to myself at first, I was pretty naive. I go, man, they're giving away all the answers. No, they're not giving you the, giving out the answers. He's just giving the bigger picture view of what they're looking for. It's up to me as a promote, promote, promotional candidate when I get in that room to demonstrate to them that I can not just be a safe beginner, but I can hit the ground running. So one of the biggest things that you're going to get graded on, and if you go back to episode five, I talked about the more common events. So I'll try to tie these into the common events. So obviously in a written examination, the multiple choice test, 
you're only getting, you're really not getting graded on anything except regurgitating information that you might have read. But oral communications, you're gonna get graded on oral communications during the oral interview. Maybe if you have a personnel or subordinate counseling scenario, you're gonna get graded on oral communications during your fire ground emergency scene scenario. So if you're not comfortable speaking in front of groups, become comfortable. Start taking Toastmaster classes or whatever, take opportunities to speak in front of others, give classes, whatever it is, you gotta be comfortable because the Raiders know you're nervous, but you know what? They can only do so much to try to put you at ease. You gotta help yourself. So oral communication is a big thing, especially the higher up you go. You're also getting graded on written communications. Now, obviously during an oral interview, they're not gonna grade you on written communications because it's an oral interview. And I don't mean that sarcastically. I'm trying to help tie these into the, each of the processes so you understand where each of these may come in. Obviously, if there's an in-basket or writing exercise, written communication is gonna be key. But in an in-basket written communication, obviously there's in-basket or writing exercise, there's no oral communication. So that's how they tie in. Obviously, if you have a fire ground scenario to manage, there may not be a lot of written communication. You may have to fill out a tactical worksheet to document your resources, track your resources, personnel assignments, but you gotta be good at oral communications. You gotta be good at written communications. Obviously, especially if you're going for company officer and above, you're gonna get evaluated for your leadership ability. Are you a leader? And leaders aren't born. I mean, I, I don't subscribe to that. I think leaders are made. So you can teach a lot of things. Not everyone's meant to be a leader, but there's a lot of things that can be taught. So you're gonna be evaluated for your leadership ability, especially the higher up you go, the more it's important. Command presence, think about that. You're getting a fire ground exercise. They're gonna give you a simulated fire. You know, you're, you're first on scene as a captain or maybe first battalion chief on scene to relieve the captain if you're the battalion chief. How good is this command presence? You pull up to that first alarm working fire and you know, you turn around the corner and on the video during your event in the promotional assessment center, they give you say a, I don't know, three-story building with fire out of every window, people jumping off the roof. I mean, a chaotic scene. Command presence. You pull around the scene. Do they want to hear you in your fire ground exercise? Oh my God, engine three is on scene. Send us everything you got. Give us the hallelujah package. Holy sh blah, blah, blah. It's not good command presence. There's got to be a sense of urgency versus command three. Engine one is on scene of a three-story type five building, fire out of every window on the alpha, the front side. Start a second alarm, staging area is gonna be located over here, break. Engine two, your assignment is gonna be blah, 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 you know, and going through the list, establishing command, giving out assignments. Command presence is key, especially for company officers and battalion chiefs, and fire chiefs too, obviously, but command presence is key. So find out what it takes for you to be calm, cool, collect but also not the flip side of, what's up? Engine one's on scene. Yep, got work and fire. We got this. I'll be establishing command. Okay, you don't need to be the cool dude or dude that either. Competent, capable, be that person that instills command presence. That's my point. And obviously there's a lot of books like mine out there that I think is a valuable resource to give you more information about each of these items. But there's also many other great books out there by other people if you do a Google search. Another good book that I endorse, Andoni Castros has a great Mastering the Fire Service Assessment Center book. Complimentary to what I'm doing, but slightly different with my own flavor. He's got his flavor, I've got my flavor, good friends. I've known him for probably about 20, 27, 28 years when I interned with his former fire department as a medic student. So, I mean, we go way back and he's a good friend of mine and I endorse the stuff that he does as well too. But again, other good things. I'm here not just to share my good thoughts, my good ideas, but also share you or point you in directions other in other ways that can be beneficial too. But again, prepare for the position, but understand the test. Other things you're gonna get graded on. Decision-making skills. So think about this, you're asked in an oral interview. So Steve, tell us how you would handle this situation because it's very common to get a hypothetical scenario and you're sitting there ready to answer the question. You're going, hmm, well, um, uh, I think I would probably take the hose line in the front door, but then maybe I'll take the hose line in around the side to go into the back door or maybe I'll take it through the garage door. Okay. 
that's very common, sadly, from some promotional candidates is they throw out, it's like the shotgun effect, I call it. They throw out different things, hoping something sticks. And then most of the time after they've given us three different alternatives, one of the raters has to raise their hand and say pretty much, okay, you just gave us a few different options. What are you gonna actually do now? Make a decision. So you've gotta be decisive. You can't be indecisive because think about it. Who wants a boss managing a fire engine, managing a fire truck, or even as a battalion chief, managing multiple fire companies, firehouses that can't make a decision or is very indecisive. So make a decision. Be able to delegate when appropriate. Don't dump. Delegate to empower and to mentor others and to train others. Train your replacements, as they say. But there's a balance of you delegate. You also still need to check up, not micromanage, but delegation is key on certain things. Problem analysis. Can you analyze the problem? You know, don't just jump to conclusions because your first instinct may not be correct, but you got to be able to fully analyze the problem, not to analysis paralysis where you can't make a decision. Because remember, when you're going to an assessment center, whether it's an oral interview, whether it's a writing exercise, whether it's a fire ground simulation, a personnel issue, you probably don't have more than 30 minutes, 45 max in the room with the Raiders. So you can't just sit there, well, huh, that's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. I got to think on that one for a little, okay. Put yourself in the Raiders shoes. They're looking for safe beginners that can hit the ground running. They know you're not going to be perfect, but you know what? They also got to know that you may get promoted immediately if you come out number one. So you better be able to do the job that you want to do. And you're, demonstrating that you think you can do. But analysis of a problem is critical, just like problem solving ability is critical as well too. Um, being able to not just jump to conclusions, but take in the facts. And there's a lot of good um, mnemonics to use for stuff like this. So these are some of the things that you're getting evaluated on. So what are some more things you're getting evaluated on? Again, dimensions or behaviors or traits. These again are, are bigger picture items that the Raiders are looking at. And when they're asking you questions or they're having you do certain things, this is the things they're grading you on. So if you want to know more information about each of these, like I said, my book has some more information. There's a lot of other good resources out there. Like I said, how to ma uh, excuse me, mastering the fire department testing. Um, Andoni Castro's book as well too, has got a lot of good stuff in there as well. There's not a lot of books out there, which is one of the reasons I put mine together. So, you know, again, do an internet search, but again, you're also getting evaluated on organizational skills planning ability or planning skills, you're gonna get evaluated on incident command system use. Now, obviously, some of this stuff is more geared toward like the fire ground exercise, the emergency simulation exercise or tactical exercise, whatever they call it. But you gotta use ICS and understand ICS. Um, and now you may be the one that says, well, my department, we really don't use ICS. Even though we're supposed to use ICS, we really don't use ICS. Well, guess what? Think about this. You may think that your department doesn't do that well, but guess what? The oral, excuse me, the raters on your promotional exam are probably individuals that understand best practices. Usually those that are oral board or just promotional assessment center raters are usually people that are in the know. They're the movers and the shakers, the fire service. They're not the slackers. So they're the ones that are gonna be expecting you to be not, not necessarily on the cutting edge, but doing the right thing out there and doing the best practices. And so understand the stuff about the best thing I can say. Flexibility. Now, one thing, it's one thing to be decisive, but it's also another thing to be flexible. Let's say you're very de decisive. Let's say you decide, okay, first arriving captain, I pull up on scene, I've got fire showing from the front of the house, the alpha side, the street side. I immediately do my 360, and I realize that, you know what, the best way to take the hose line in is gonna be probably through whatever portal window, door, front door, back door, garage, I don't care. But let's say you do that, or let's, let's step back. Let's say you see fire showing from the front and you go, you know what, we'll probably take our hose line through whatever. But then you do your 360 and then you come back and say, huh, I got fire out of every orifice. I got literally fire out of every orifice, the structure. Guess what? We are not doing an interior offensive attack given the resources and staffing that we have right now. This is a defensive firefight right now. We may start out, I know, hitting it hard from the yard, some of you just hate that term. We may start out, doesn't mean we're staying defensive, we may start out in a transitional mode. And for those of you that say, well, this is new stuff, no, go back to Lloyd Lehman, it's been around for years. We may start out with a transitional mode where we have minimal staffing and we, maybe we 
get it under control here. And then maybe once we get things going or more staffing, then maybe we can go in and do an offensive, switch from defensive to offensive. But again, the key is being flexible. The key is not putting your, or drawing, what do they say, draw your uh, line in the sand. Because guess what? If you have more information that tells you otherwise, you better be flexible enough to change it. If not, you know, you go, I mean, here's a good example. Let's say you decide to go into a burning building. That's what we do. We're firefighters. I get it. But then the oral board or the whatever, the writer stops you and says, okay, hold on a second. You said that you're going to go inside and make this an offensive firefight. You failed to do a 360. Oh, uh, crap. Yeah, I did. Well, when you do your 360, here's the pictures of the, you know, the other sides, the Bravo, Charlie, and Delta sides. You're going into a fully involved building. So you're basically going into a death mission. You're going to put yourself and your crew members in harm's way by sending them into a fully involved structure. And I know there's some people that go back to de decisiveness and they say, well, I don't want to be indecisive. So I'm just going to go, yeah, I'm going to go on in. That's what I first decided we're going to do it. Whether we die or live or get injured. Versus flexible enough to be able to tell the, or well, based on the additional information that I should have discovered when I first arrived on scene for, and I should have done my 360, now that I have that additional information, we're not going to take an offensive um, stance at this instant. We're going to start off with a defensive stance. And once I get more resources, and if we can make good headway on this, then we'll maybe transition to an offensive. But thank you for the additional information. Hey, there's a time and a place to be flexible. There's a time and a place to be decisive, but be able to be both. Another thing that you may get evaluated on is situational awareness. Again, firefighters typically do things at the task level. That's the way they're trained. But as a company officer, and especially as a chief officer, you've got to have more of that 30,000 foot view, that balcony view, as they call it, uh, view from the sky, so more situationally aware. So that's what versus getting stuck in the weeds. Also, time management. Time management in the sense of they're going to probably tell you, hey, you got 30 minutes or less, or you got 20 minutes or less, or whatever the time frame is. You got to use your time wisely. There may or may not be a clock in the room, but usually the proctor that's there, or maybe one of the raiders will give you a heads up of like, hey, you got five minutes left, or you got two minutes left, so you better wrap it up or start wrapping things up. Or they may not. But again, most department, most departments, if not every department, does not want to see candidates fail. Because if we put a promotional exam together and everyone fails, then we got to look in the mirror and say, what did we do wrong? Because it's not meant for everyone to be failing. Well, it was so hard that nobody could pass it. Okay. And what did we prove by doing that? Just like if everyone um, passes it, maybe it's too easy. I don't know. But again, every department's different, but usually we're here to try to get candidates to succeed. We need a list, but we also need people to do the job and be capable and competent. So time management, strategy, tactics, sort of ties with ICS, but if you're going for the tactical exercise, you're probably going to be first arriving company officer like I shared or battalion chief that's maybe at the end of the first alarm string. You got to have a good solid understanding of strategy and tactics um, because you're going to be managing an incident. Um, judgment, you know, again, do you use good judgment? Do you use faulty judgment? Common sense, those types of things. Some other dimensions you're getting graded on knowledge of fire department standard operating guidelines or standard operating procedures, whatever your department calls them. Well, you may say, well, my department doesn't have any of these. Well, okay, then one less thing to worry about. But your department still probably has some type of policies or rules or regulations or guidelines, whatever you call them, but you got to know your policies because you're going to get evaluated on them. And you go, well, I, those are binders in the station or they're on the computer. And yeah, they are. But as a company officer, chief officer, you got to have a good general working knowledge of these things or and at least where to find them when necessary. Uh, safety is a big thing that you may get evaluated on. And a good example of that is when you pull up to that structure fire, do you establish two in, two out or not? Do you establish a rapid intervention crew or team or not? You know, it's, it really, it usually want a failing point is like when you're taking a tactical exercise. So when they give you that fire ground scene, there's usually a curveball in there. Not to, th not to throw you a curveball, but to be real life, realistic. And the curveball usually is firefighter down, missing or trapped. And you know, you're five minutes into your exercise thinking you got nailed because you got water in the fire, you got enough resources. And then they tell you, hey, I see you got a report of a missing firefighter or down firefighter. What you gonna do? And then it's like, oh crap. Yeah. Well, a good incident commander looks at their staging area or their location, because you shouldn't have your rapid mission crew or team in your staging area, but they should be close by, ready to go into action. 
but a good incident commander will go, okay, well, I've already established rapid intervention. I'm going to go activate them. And they're also going to look at their staging area. And a good incident commander also has adequate resources in their staging area because we know the lag time or the delay time that it takes from when you call a second alarm or third alarm, or whatever it is, just to get them there. So again, a good incident commander has resources they can immediately deploy grab some resources from staging, call additional alarms as appropriate, no, but again, have enough resources where they can still do not just the firefight, but also now the firefighter made a situation. But there's nothing more embarrassing when you see candidates who never establish a rapid intervention, and then they're all of a sudden, uh-oh, you can tell that look in their face. They go, oh crap, I got a firefighter down, missing or trapped, and I don't even have a rapid intervention team. Now, for the purists, I know that I know we can probably argue all day the value of rapid intervention and the fact that rapid intervention is usually not rapid. If you look at all the studies, especially Don Abbott, who retired out of the Phoenix Fire Department, Don's doing a great Project Mayday right now. I encourage you to check out Project Mayday, Don Abbott, Google that stuff. He's done a lot of real-time studies in the you know last few years about what's causing maydays to occur. How are firefighters helping themselves or not helping themselves? What are the contributing factors? And the studies have shown that the rapid intervention team is usually not the one that saves the firefighter. Usually if the firefighter doesn't put themselves in that position or their crews that are working in that immediate area are the ones that help them out, if, if, if at all. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have rapid intervention. So long story short, I know a lot of candidates go, well, in real life, we don't do it that way. So this is fantasy land, the test. Okay, you should be treating the test the same way as you would real life. I mean, it should be the same way, and that's what you're getting graded on. And if you're cutting corners in real life, then don't cut corners in the promotional exam. Do the right thing in the promotional exam, and then do the right thing when you're actually in the position, because there's no reason to be cutting corners. Other things you're getting evaluated on, your interpersonal skills. How nicely do you play in the sandbox with others? You know, do you come in swinging the hammer hard and dropping the hammer, or are you too nice? You know, there's a balance in there. You let people walk all over you. You know, another common scoring dimension is the ability to remain calm under pressure. Because guess what? They're going to give you stressful situations and they're going to expect you to be able to manage those situations. And you may go, wait a second. Yeah. Think about it. Company officer, chief officer, even engineer, you're going to be under stress. That's the job. Even as a firefighter, you're under stress. So a company officer, a battalion chief, promotional exam, the stress may be, hey, by the way, you got a firefighter down, figure it out. And that's stressful. It, it should be stressful. So they're going to give you curveballs, but can you manage that stress safely, effectively, without falling apart at the seams? It goes back to command presence. Another thing you may get graded on, customer service. And I know some people don't like to use the term customer. Or those, you know, the, the, the community we serve, the public, whatever you call them. Customer service for the community and taking care of your own members within the department. As simple as that, doing the right thing for the right reasons at the right time. Other things you may get graded on, your knowledge of local, state, and federal standards and laws, such as OSHA, NFPA, accepted industry standards, and so forth. Now, I know I hear from people around the country, well, Steve, my state's not an OSHA state, or we don't follow OSHA. Yeah, it's, OSHA's there, but we don't follow it, you know, or we don't follow NFPA. Okay, I don't care if you follow it or not follow it. Odds are your raters from their departments are going to follow it, and they're going to expect you to follow best practices. And chances are your department's going to expect that as well, too, because just because you maybe fly by the seat of your pants on the fire ground, chances are I don't think your department wants you to be doing those things, which is why they have you get tested on those things in a promotional examination. I mean, I've heard some, de I've heard some departments say, two in, two out, screw that crap. I mean, I've heard that from some firefighters, not their fire chief, but the firefighters and captains. And I remember one department, hey, every fire is a rescue until proven otherwise. Every fire is a rescue to proven otherwise. I get it. I don't argue that. But there's also the OSHA, which is a law, two in, two out. And again, do your own homework so you understand that because you're going to get asked questions related to two in, two out, most likely on your captain's and battalion chief's test. But if you put your finger in the air over two in, two out, what message does that send to your personnel? Now, you may say, well, the public's more important than our personnel. I'm not debating who's more important. And if we don't go in hazardous environments, why do we even have a fire department? I totally get that. There's a reason we're usually paid the way we, we are paid and get the benefits we get because of we're going to go in hazardous environments to try to risk our lives for savable lives. 
um, and even sometimes lives that may not be 100% savable, but we believe that we have a chance of making a difference. I get that. But there's a balancing act there too. So don't be rogue. Just go in there doing the right thing um, for the right reasons. I mean, because that's why we should be doing it. I mean, get, there's a time and a place to get our butts inside a burning building. And there's a time and a place, like I mentioned a little while ago, that you pull up on scene and there's fire out of every orifice. Guess what? You probably aren't going inside. But if there's only fire in what appears to be one room or one portion of the house, yeah, it's probably safe to get, in your, get into that building following best practices and getting water on the fire and getting a good aggressive primary search done to make sure nobody else is still inside there. I get it, but there's a balance. So understand the laws and the standards because those are things you're gonna be held against, held against you. And you may go, well, my department doesn't really follow that stuff. Well, I don't care if your department follows them or not, you better follow them. It's just the right thing to do for the personnel that you serve and the community that's paying you to be there. And you go, well, I'm just volunteer. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you're volunteer paid. It's we're still killing and injuring volunteers just like we are career firefighters. So do the right things for the right reasons. Um, last couple of things you're getting evaluated on risk management. I mean, sort of ties into situational awareness to a degree, but also risk management. Again, we're gonna go into that burning building. Yeah, the burning building that's got fire out of every orifice. Okay, that's not really good risk management. But again, fire's only in one small portion of this building. So you know what? Yeah, we're gonna go in. You know, so appropriate risk management. I mean, whatever saying that your department uses or you think is appropriate. Hey, ultimately, this is what the panel wants to know. Can you do the job? Because again, in many departments, when that list is established and that ranking comes out of number one, number two, number three, odds are there's gonna be usually immediate promotions in many departments. So don't be the one that goes in the test saying, well, you know what? Hopefully I won't come out number one. Hopefully I'll come out number eight or nine and they'll promote a few people and then I'll just get some acting time in. Well, okay, but what happens if you come out number one or two and the fire chief needs to promote five people? You can tell the chief, well, chief, I'm not really ready right now. Can you hold off maybe six months or a year? <laughs> it don't work that way. The chief will probably say, oh, I can hold off. There's no guarantee I'm gonna have another spot for you, but I'll be happy to go to the next person. Yeah. So make sure you're in this for the right reasons because you could get a badge immediately and you better be ready to hit the ground running because guess what? The community expects you to be that way, doing your job to the best of your abilities as does the personnel that you are fortunate to lead and serve. So with that, since you now know what they're grading you on, now it's time to be the best that you can be in each of those categories so you can actually get promoted and not have to take the darn test again. I know a lot of people say, well, I'm just gonna take the test to see what it's like and get a, you know, so I can better prepare for the next one or the one after that, because I'm just not ready and I'd love to be a firefighter for another couple of years. Hey, life promotions doesn't always work on our timetable. I mean, it'd be nice if it happened that way, but if you're gonna take the darn test, take it knowing that you could get promoted. Don't take it half-ass and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not even gonna put my time and effort in it because I'm not gonna get promoted. And then next thing you know, you get promoted. What message does that send to the now your crews that you're gonna be leading and supervising, huh? That doesn't send a good message because they want someone that they can respect, that is competent, capable of doing the job, and someone that can lead them and lead them in the right direction, not lead them into failure or disaster. So do it, do it for the right reasons. So in closing, as always, my contact information, feel free to reach out if I can ever be of assistance to you. Until the next time, be safe, take care, and we'll see you soon.